so that uh, is a good I don't start. want to... Uh... Well, Sir Arthur, may I first welcome you to the RAF Staff College and thank you for agreeing to discuss with us the bomber offensive in World War II. Now, you became Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command in February 1942, did you not? That's true. At that time, what was the state of the command when, when you took over? Well, uh, they had the butt reports and that sort of thing, and they come to the conclusion they weren't hitting very much, and they certainly hadn't got very much to hit things with. Uh, the command was being robbed right, left, and center by every other command, especially by the coastal and the navy. And few people realized that it was just used as a sort of milch cow. Uh, for instance, we did all the training in, uh, uh, for the overseas command. Yes. One month we, went, we lost 145 pilots sent to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. What on earth they were doing with them there, I don't know. They couldn't possibly have uh, worn them out or even lost them. Mm -hmm. I think they must have used them as yes. doormen on every... Uh, Outfit in Cairo. Yes. In fact, you had fewer crews at the beginning of 1942 than you'd had towards the end of 1941, didn't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. indeed. What, what about the navigation equipment and the actual weapon systems that were, you, you were using at that time? The navigational equipment, when I took over, was negligible. Mm -hmm. Certain amount of DF. G was just coming on. Yeah. And they just ran, just before I took over, they'd run an experimental exercise with G and been very really disappointed with the results. Mm -hmm. However, it was better than nothing. Yes, yes, yes. Anything was better than nothing in right. those days. Right, right. Of course, the main failure, which existed almost throughout the war where the bombers were concerned, was the miserable armament they had. Yes. The 303 bullet is about as much good against a modern fighter, mm -hmm. uh, or not much better, than using a pea shooter against an elephant. Yes, and of course the German fighters at that time had cannon weapons as well. Of course well. they had cannon. Out outranged yes. and outgunned. Yes. Yeah. 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 What effect did that, was that having on morale on crews when you took over? Was there any marked sign at all? I thought the morale of the crews was incredibly good. Did you? Quite incredibly yes. good. Yes, yes. But uh, I realized something had to be done to let them see that they were getting dividends. Yes, yes. For what they were doing, and that really was at the back of the whole idea of the thousand bomber raid. Yeah. Because in fact, you mounted the thousand bomber raids within a very short time of taking over a CNC. Did you? Yes. Not? But it was for that particular purpose, yes. to let the crews realize that they could do yes. something yes. really effective if only they had the numbers yes. and the equipment to do it with. Quite, quite. When you took over, were you given any specific directive as CNC? Oh, yes. Uh, I lived in a shower of directives uh, from the day I took over to the last day of the war. Mm -hmm. But the directive uh, when I took over was the one that I wasn't to specifically aim at anything and this ordered to do so, mm -hmm. except to blast the uh, German cities as a whole. Yes, if I may just interrupt sir, for a second there, sir. I think this is a very important point to make because your name has frequently been associated with the initiation of the attacks on city centres. But in fact, the directive, the formal directive, arrived at High Wycombe before you did, did it not? This oh, was yes. an established policy when you took before. over. before. And uh, I think there's a minute existing in the Air Ministry from the CAS to the uh, DCAS telling him to make quite certain I really understood yes. that that particular yes. directive meant what it said. Yes, yes. Subsequently, though, um, there were occasions when, although you clearly understood some of the directives, you 
perhaps did you occasionally seek to evade them or perhaps uh, interpret them, shall we say? No, I wouldn't agree with that. Uh, they were uh, items in some directives which I knew were impossible of achievement. Mm -hmm. And naturally enough, I argued against them. Yes. Yes. But it's my job to do right. so. So you had a considerable amount of flexibility as C&C. &C. Exactly. Yes. 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 Um, I believe on one occasion you anticipated a directive, did you not? When you had problems with one particular piece of equipment and you were having difficulty with getting the necessary support from MOD, did you not take advantage of a, an old civilian friend to do some engineering work for you? Ah, oh, that was in the early days of the war when I commanded uh, the number five group. Ah. Ah. Uh, that was before I went to ah, America for eight months. Pardon, I was thinking it was later. That was the Hamden aircraft. It had the most ridiculous back gun margin. Mm -hmm. uh, you had no possibility of holding the gun steady. And I couldn't get anything done about it, so I went to a, a local engineering firm, Rose Brothers, asked them if they couldn't do better, and they certainly did. Mm -hmm. So I ordered uh, enough of them to equip all my Hamdens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was no good me ordering just one or two to look at, or I'd have been made to pay for them. But I couldn't possibly have been made to pay for the equipping of the whole, all the Hamdens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't got the money. Yes, yes, and that, that <laughs> That piece of kit was subsequently developed, was it not, for the other aeroplanes? Oh, yes. Uh, they developed that, and they developed a very good balloon cutter. Yes, yes. Again, staying on this, the broad subject of directives and targets, there were many discussions about which particular kind of target system to concentrate on. And I think I'm right in saying that when the concept of panacea targets was produced, you were not very enthusiastic about that, were you? No, I certainly wasn't, because uh, they arrived in showers. Uh, any bright lad, in or out of the service, uh, and in the Air Ministry or the scientists, and they had a bright idea, or the Ministry of Economic Warfare, uh, they seemed to think that uh, their ideas could be put into the test, and I took the responsibility for the results, and I, naturally enough, uh, didn't quite agree with that idea. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I've always been taught when I was at the Army Staff College that there's a principle of war known as the maintenance of the objective. Either the object or the objective. And uh, you cannot change what you're aiming at every few days and no. still maintain either the object or the objective. Although there were problems with the Panacea targets. Obviously, Bomber Command could, when required, hit very important, critical targets. Um, perhaps the two best-known examples are the attack on the dams and the attack on Pinamunda. Would you care to say a little about those two particular <coughs> raids? Yes, well, do you see now those were types of targets that could definitely be found. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I first took over the command, the first thing I did was to concentrate on coastal targets. Not because the coastal targets were the most important, but what you can always see, if you can see anything in the dark, is a coastline. Because you can see the difference between the land and the water and the, and the foam of the breaking waves. It shows up if you can see anything at all. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons we made those attacks in the Baltic to, uh, against Lubeck, uh, Rostock, places like that. The Pinamunda attack, of course, was a specially ordered one in order to uh, deal with the genesis of the rocket. And that, again, was a fairly easy place to find. Yes. Because uh, it could be... Uh, spotted in relation to an island mm. close in shore. Mm -hmm. And that was when uh, we started this game of the master bomber to direct the whole of the attack, and it was very successful. Mm -hmm. 
That was largely due to Sir Rafe Cochrane, who commanded five groups yes. at that time. Yes. Yes. Did you develop the master bomber in any other way? Um, for example, how was the master bomber concept related to the Pathfinder force generally? It wasn't. The two, uh, the two uh, concepts were quite different. The Pathfinder force adopted the idea as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. rightly so. People always saying, uh, uh, official people, that I was against the formation of the Pathfinder force. Mm -hmm. Now that is absolutely true, but it's one of these half-truths that are worse mm -hmm. than a deliberate misstatement. Mm -hmm. What I was hoping to get was the Pathfinder force in every group and without in any way belittling the magnificent achievements of the Pathfinder Force as a whole, my idea of having a Pathfinder apparatus of some sort in every group was eventually arrived at, and that is when we really got results. Yes, yes, yes. As, the, uh, as 1942 moved into 1943, there were quite clearly tangible results beginning to be seen from the work that Bomber Command was doing. How were those results assessed at the time? What sort of intelligence were you getting? The, the point that prompts that, that comment, sir, is that traditionally in warfare, a general, which is in one sense what you were, who is fighting a sustained campaign, after all, you were fighting a war every day for three years. You were fighting a battle every day for three years. Every night. Every night, every day, every night for three years. Traditionally, a general has been able to see the impact of his strategy. How, was, how did you measure the success and the progress of your campaign? Simply from the photographs. The photographs. There's no other way of doing it. Yes. A certain amount of intelligence leaked through, of course, from Germany, yes. from, uh, well, uh, neutral embassies and, mm -hmm. you know, writing home to their girlfriends and mm -hmm. things like that. Yes. We got a certain amount of information yes. that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the intelligence service did, uh, on the whole, I think, pretty well. Yes. So all you could really assess the impact by was the physical damage. On the photographs. On the photographs. Yes. There was no way of assessing the actual disruption caused to industry or loss rates or anything of that kind at the time, was there? Oh, no. None at all. No. Of course not, no no. no. no, no. We got plenty of that later from no. Albert Speer. Quite, quite. And other leading yes. Germans. Yes, yes. I, I noticed um, on one occasion that the Enigma system, which was producing the information by tapping into the, the German intelligence network, um, produced a lot of information for our commanders. Was this information fed back to you as, as Commander-in-Chief? I was never told of the source, but of course uh, any information that was relevant, relevant to my yes. job yes. was uh, sent on to me. Yes. Yes. But uh, my view uh, at the time, of course, was a view I've always held that uh, everybody always thinks their own code is unbreakable, mm -hmm. and everybody always knows that you always break the other fellow's code. Yes, yes. yes. As the, the years moved on, as we came into 1943 and 1944, did you at any time ever doubt the outcome of your own strategy. I was thinking perhaps at the time of the raids on Berlin during the winter of 1943 and 1944. No, I never doubted it. The only thing I doubted was whether we were ever going to be given more than uh, a quarter or at most a half of what we'd asked for yes. originally to do the job yes. with. Yes. Yes. You see, as fast as we were given, <coughs> something that seemed to be taken away. Yes. Rather like yes. the Treasury, you know, with our allowances. They give it to us one hand That's and take, take away, away a bit more of the other. Yes, yes, we're very familiar with that nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> very familiar. Yes, uh, of course, in 1942, you had the diversion not only of the Middle East, but you also had the Atlantic War diversion, did you not? The what war? The, the diversion of the bomber offensive at the bombers to assist coastal command. Oh, yes. Yes, and the Admiralty were trying to grab the lot the whole time. Yes. There was a perennial argument going on. Yes. The Admiralty wanted all our bombers looking for needles in the haystack, yes. which is the least profitable exercise yes. of yes. all. Yes. 
and we said the place to get the submarines was where they were born, not where they went to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course we were right, and uh, who says we were right? Albert Speer, he mm -hmm. was responsible for producing mm -hmm. submarines and everything else. Mm -hmm. And he says quite plainly in his book, we would have kept to our promised output of submarines for Admiral yeah. Donuts if the bombers had not destroyed a third of them in the ports. Yes. Yes. Well, we certainly would never have destroyed a third of them looking for them in the Atlantic. No. So that when then you, for a while, were able to mount a large-scale bomber offensive in the winter of 1943 and 1944, losses among air crews rose quite steadily. Now, I think frequently this figure, the overall figure of something like 55,000 air crew who were lost during the war, I think that figure is, is frequently taken out of proportion. We tend to forget, for example, that as I'm sure you will recall, on the first day of the Somme in 1916, we lost 60,000 men before lunch. Mm. Um, and 70,000 before the evening. That's right. So this, this puts things in perspective. Yeah. Um, the impact of losses on the development of the command, was it beginning to show at all in the winter of 1943-44? Were you not so much worried about the overall impact of the strategy, but the actual impact of losses of crews on the strategy? You mean by shortage of crews? Yes. No, yes. not at all, no. No, the, uh, the worst impact where the shortage of crews were concerned was the continual drain, especially ah. to the Middle East. Yes. Yes. Especially yes. to the Middle East. Yes. You know, you hear a lot about the Bomber Command's casualties. Now, you quoted the sum very rightly as an example of picking out one incident. Mm. Well, I could probably, without any trouble, find a thousand incidents in the first war yeah. where small patrols went out wire cutting or investigating German trenches and things and lost 100%. Yes. But they do, you don't hear the army talking about 100% oh. casualties. No. You spread it over the whole war. Right. And Bomber Command's casualties over the entire war were slightly under 3%. Yes. Uh, the history, unfortunately, refers to, for instance, the losses on that Nuremberg raid, which went wrong because of the weather. And it was a miracle they went a dozen Nurembergs mm -hmm. in this climate and with the resources our Met people had in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, you hear time and again that, uh, well, actually written in the history, that brought the offensive to a full stop, a full stop. It's a most incredible statement, of a good many incredible statements mm -hmm. in that official history. The actual losses in the whole of that month of March, including Nuremberg, and that month of March saw the heaviest bombing mm. of Germany of the entire war up to that date. The losses throughout March were the lowest for 13 months. Mm -hmm. And as for it uh, bringing the bombing of Germany to a dead stop, we, a fortnight later, we were handed over to Eisenhower's command for pre-invasion yes. work, etc., etc. And uh, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that we were approaching the short nights of summer, which always reduced our effort, mm. in spite of the fact that we were put onto a tremendous amount of anti-rocket sight mm -hmm. bombing when the rockets yes. were yes. threatening. Yes this country. In spite of all that, the ensuing two months saw some of the heaviest bombing of the war, and the official history said it brought us to a full stop. Mm -hmm. With the, in the next two months, we ran some six, nearly 6,000 sorties deep into Germany and dropped just under 20,000 tons of bombs on them. Yes. Some ruddy full stop, wasn't it? Yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. In fact, sir, I wonder if I can pick up two points out of that. Um, one point I meant to ask you, it was near the end of 1943 when your requests for night fighter escorts was turned down, was it not, by MOD? 
Um, I'm a little unclear about the actual circumstances which well, surrounded it. I don't remember it being definitely turned down. I do remember them repeatedly saying, we ain't got none. Yes, yes. Yeah. Rather than saying yes. you can't have, yes. uh, we won't ah. give you any. Oh. Oh. I think that was the trouble. Yes. 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 In the end, as you know, we got a few mosquitoes into Addison's 100 yes. group. Yes. And they did some very good work. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The mosquito must have been a very valuable aeroplane in your command. Yes, it's an extraordinary aeroplane because it fulfilled no known uh, specification originally and it was supposed to operate as an unarmed bomber in the days when everybody thought bombing was going to take place in daylight. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and a few other people like me didn't, mm -hmm. but still, and I'd been on night flying most of my career. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the Mosquito as an unarmed bomber, to my mind, hadn't got a hope. Uh, if you loaded it with bombs, then the in daylight, the fighters could catch it mm -hmm. without bombs, merely with a camera, mm -hmm. using clouds and surprise, it could get through and back again with some considerable yes. success yes. as a PIU ma machine. Yes. 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 The other point arising out of that last comment, sir, was you mentioned Eisenhower. Um, it was during your tenure, of course, as CNC that the RAF first began to work regularly side by side with American allies. Mm. How close was your liaison with the US Army Air Force generals in, the, in this period? It couldn't have been closer. They were, and they still are, those that are alive amongst my best personal friends. Uh, well, when uh, Acre came over to start forming the 8th, bomber force, the American bomber force, mm -hmm. he lived in my house with me yeah. for about two months mm -hmm. uh, while they were setting up their own headquarters. But Aker, Anderson, Jimmy Doolittle couldn't have had better cooperation mm -hmm. from anybody. Mm -hmm. They were also firm friends of mine and still are. Yes. Yes. Anderson, of course, is dead, but yes. uh, Aker and Doolittle, I was talking to only the other day. Yes. yes. That's obviously a very, very val valuable point, sir, because apart from the personal relations, there were, of course, very big differences in operational doctrine, were yes. there not, between the two services? They certainly were. Uh, I was convinced myself that they were going to have tremendous casualties mm -hmm. trying to operate in daylight. Yes. And uh, before I went to Bomber Command, when I was eight months in Washington working with the Americans before they were in the war, I had many a discussion with my very good friend Arnold, who was the head of the American Air Force, or the American Army Air Force, as then was, mm -hmm. on the subject of armament for their famous flying forts. As they were in those days, they certainly weren't forts. They were mm -hmm. flying, but they yes. were no yeah. You couldn't call yeah. them forts. They yeah. had handheld guns and things like that. And I offered Arnold anything, everything. I said, you can have all our turret designs, anything you want. But uh, you're going to be up against cannon. And although they'd got 0.5 guns, which we failed to get until right the last few weeks of the war, uh, they had a very tough time until the Mustang escort fighter appeared on the scene. Mm -hmm. Now, we can take credit for the fact that the Mustang appeared on the scene. I went over to buy airplanes in, uh, I think it was 37, 38. I bought the Hudson's, 100,000 of them, amongst mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. Never got any graph from Lockheed except one, <laughs> bent, one bent pin to hold a side of my specs on. They, uh, and they wouldn't let me pay for that. Uh, and uh, the PBY flying boats, and all that sort yes. of thing. Yes. And in our general look around, oh, the Oxford trainers, mm -hmm. uh, we found this uh, 
fighter, which was fitted with an Allison engine. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not belittling the Allison, except that it didn't have enough horses for the job. Mm -hmm. And it was one of these engines that had reached the end of its expandable life. And we told him it was a darn good fighter, but uh, had to have more power. Mm -hmm. Well, then they got a license to build the Rolls-Royce mm -hmm. Merlin. Mm -hmm. The combination of the two produced the Mustang fighter, and that saved the Americans. Mm. Yes, it certainly was a very, very timely introduction. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, was there any target coordination with the United States Army Air Force flying from Britain? Were you flying completely separate attack programs or was there any kind of coordination? No, there was quite a lot of coordination. How was that done? For the first uh, six months that the Americans were in, uh, Ira Aker, as I say, not only lived with me for a couple of months, but he and his successors, Anderson, and Jimmy Doolittle mm -hmm. used to attend my morning conference when we were deciding targets. Mm -hmm. And we would discuss mutual targets then. Mm -hmm. And uh, when possible, we would try and work on the lines of, uh, you set a light to a target by day or leave a cloud of smoke there, maybe we are easier to find them yeah. at night, yeah. and vice versa. We set a light at night and you'll see where it is in the daytime. Mm -hmm. What few people realize, I'm talking now about journalists, how many days in the year can you go outside and say, now, the weather's so marvelous that if I was at 25,000 feet or 20,000 feet where they were doing their stuff, I could see Victoria Station? Hmm? Very few. How many days in the year? Very few. What? One in three? In fact, they're bombing most of the time. Mm. was just as blind as ours. Yes, yes. And they had to depend on various devices. And those devices steadily progressed until, uh, well, at the end of the war, Harrison's group uh, fitted with the only supply of GH that we'd got. They were knocking out the German uh, benzol plants with tiny little plants, some of them about a hundred yards square, mm -hmm. knocking them out one after another through thousands of feet of cloud, yes. to the astonishment of the Germans. Yes. And I'm not in any way criticizing the Americans, but they had a great predilection for a large number of small bombs. And you'll find that Albert Speer says that it was the big bombs of the RAF mm -hmm that did the irreparable damage mm -hmm. to industrial plants. Yes, yes, yes. Perhaps in a moment, sir, I could come back to a uh, comment on people like Barnes Wallace, for whom I know you had a very high regard. Yes. Um, but if I could just stay with the United States for a second. Um, during the period of 1944, we come towards Overlord and the aftermath, um, some commentators have suggested that there was then a disagreement over directives. I'm referring to the transportation, the oil, and indeed the problems of attacking targets in France, which I, I think you, you had your own views on, did you not? Well, I had views to this extent. I couldn't attack everything, you see. Now you've already mentioned yes. Yes. four enormous yes. systems, yes. you yes. Yes. with four different sets of enthusiasts. Mm. You all crying for their yep. uh, principle to be adopted. Mm -hmm. During the whole of the invasion, until it was thoroughly ashore and well progressing through France, I was under Eisenhower's direct command. Yes. And I took what he said and did it. Yes. And I d we did it, I didn't do it, but my boys did it to such an extent but 25 years after the war, they released from the top secret archives uh, in America correspondence between Marshall, the head of the United States Army, and Eisenhower. Marshall, very worried, because he said the Joint Chiefs of Staff had decided 
that the invasion was going so well that the time had arrived to take the direct command of the British bombers away from him and the American bombers and return it to the heads of their own services. They had other theaters of war as well as France to compete yes, with. Right. Right. Uh, Marshall expect, uh, expressed his alarm, lest it meant that Eisenhower would get less support than he'd become used to from my boys. In Eisenhower's reply, and I could show you a copy of it, he says to Marshall, and mind you, this correspondence was entirely between the two, Nobody else saw it. It wasn't issued to butter up an ally or anything, or make mm -hmm. a point, except between the two of them. He said he had no such fears as Marshall expressed about the British bombers being taken away from him. He had come to regard the British bombers as one of the most effective parts of his whole organization, mm -hmm. always seeking, finding, and using new ways of helping the armies on the ground forward. Yes. Oh. Yes. Quite. In fact, it was also during this time, I think, sir, when the improvements in both in navigation and precision began to make themselves felt. I was thinking particularly about the losses which were feared among Frenchmen and the losses which actually occurred sure. as a result of the bombing. I was uh, uh, bullied by Churchill in one particular regard. He was extremely helpful in every other. Don't kill Frenchmen. He had a horror of killing Frenchmen. Well, quite frankly, uh, uh, my opinion was if the French couldn't fight for their own country, and they certainly didn't, except for the Mackies, they packed up it just like that at the beginning of the war. They must expect to get the rough end of the stick mm. if somebody's trying to help them. You mm. can't live in the middle of a battlefield without some of the shorts and overs getting you in the back of the neck. Right, right. That was the situation right. with them. Right. I, I wonder if I could put one final question in the American context, sir. Um, as you're well aware, the modern Royal Air Force works very closely with the United States Air Force. Would you give or would you offer any kind of guidance to young British Royal Air Force officers. You obviously got on extremely well with your American colleagues. What advice would you give to contemporary British officers who are working well, with Americans? Well, I would say that uh, they won't have the smallest difficulty in getting on well with Americans. They're the sort of people that are very easy to get on with. Uh, they're apt to say, look, we're the biggest guys in the place. Well, it's absolutely true, they are. So one mustn't be uh, insulted about that. Mm -hmm. I know they made a great race to drop more bombs than we dropped during the war. Mm -hmm. And they just won by a short head, by a few tons. Yes, yes. yes. Just to make that point. Yes. Well, I didn't mind. Yes. I certainly wasn't going to compete on those lines. It was just a bit of fun. Fine. Thank you, sir. I wonder now, then, if we could turn to a rather broader issue, sir. Um, looking back over those three years in command, what would you say were the most difficult problems that as a commander you had to overcome to implement your strategy? Oh, the most difficult problem of all was to not only to uh, get sufficient aircraft for the job, but to hold on to what I'd got. That was a continual argument. Mm. Everybody wanted them, not only the Admiralty and Coastal Command, but Middle East, then the Far East began. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the job, yes. hanging on to what we got, yeah. let alone getting enough yes. for the job. So diversions. We had really always said we problem. wanted 4,000 uh, frontline strength of heavies yes. to do the job. That's if the Americans hadn't come in. Yes. Well, we never got near that. No, no. But together with the Americans, we went very far off it in the end. Right, right. Now, shortages, we, we've heard on how you dealt with one particular shortage earlier as a group commander. Um, were the shortages in any particular area, was it airframe, engine, uh, avionics, navigation aids, or was it just the whole thing? Was it the entire? No, I wouldn't call them shortages so much as the necessity to develop yes. 
new things mm -hmm. or to uh, modify and improve existing things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, oboe didn't originally come up to expectations, but by the time they'd improved it, and by the time we'd got our stations ashore on the continent, then it was, of course, the cat's whiskers. Yes. As a navigational yes. tool. Yes. Yes. Would you say that the support from the Minister of Defence staffs was all that it could be? Once or twice in your memoirs, you were a wee bit scathing about the support you got from MOD, and there appears implicit in some of your comments that while you had the highest regard for people like Dr. Barnes Wallace and many of the other scientists who were working reasonably close to you, sometimes you felt that down the road in Whitehall or in London, your objectives and your views weren't quite shared so enthusiastically as they might have been. Well, I've been halted all my life in the service, and I always issue it as a warning to my successors by the ease of saying no. And when you're dealing with an organization where a request from you goes up through half a dozen different uh, bodies, any one of them, uh, to put it crudely, if he's in a hurry to get out to lunch or something like that, can put a no down. And I developed the habit in the service, and in my own command, I always said, I'm the only fellow who can say no. I had to modify that because of the size of the command, but I told the senior heads of the departments, you can also say no, but you better come immediately to me and explain why you said it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, uh, eased a lot of pressure on the group's commanders mm -hmm. at the time. And I've had so many in peacetime, good Lord. Mm -hmm. Simple little things that were essential. No, no, no. It was like pushing at a cotton wool mm -hmm. curtain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example, apart from the gun mounting. As you know, in a multi-engine aircraft, you have a, a twin-engine aircraft, you push the throttle forward to open your engines up, but if you want more port than starboard, you twist. Mm -hmm. You open up one and shut back another, like that. Well, you must have that for manoeuvring on the ground, nice and easy to work. Mm -hmm. When you get in the air, unless it's really stiff, it's apt to ease up with the vibration and keep on working yes. back. And then you have to hold it until yes. you get home yes. or carry a pocket full of spanners. Mm -hmm. All I asked for to cure that in the old Virginias when I commanded a Virginia night flying squadron was a big butterfly nut, cost half a crown. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, dear. Dear, and when Boom was making his annual inspection, <laughs> and I complained about this yes. no habit. He yes. said, give me one example. Yes. I gave him that example. Yes. He said, oh, well, I'll see to it. You shall have your butterfly nuts. I said, sir, I've already got them. I ordered them myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose this kind of problem must have been aggravated because of the very, very rapid expansion of the bomber force. Quite naturally. Yes, but it is Sorry. basically, it's the human fault. Oh, yes, yes. Of, it's easy to say no. Yes. And the work is done. Yes. If you say yes, you've got to do some work about yes. it. Yes. And people who are under great pressure with a tremendous yes. amount of work already on their shoulders right. don't easily adopt another spadeful. Right. I was just wondering if that problem was further complicated by the fact that the bomber expansion had taken place so quickly over such a short space of time. There must have been staff men at MOD who really had no knowledge of large-scale bomber oh, operations yes, at all. Oh, indeed, indeed. Not at all. And we'd only just recovered uh, a year or two before the war from a, a large number of top senior officers who really didn't know yes. quite what they were talking about where yeah. an aeroplane was concerned. 
Yes, yes. I, I'd like, if I may, sir, to pick that point up later on, after lunch, because I think it's a very important one, obviously. I wonder, though, how then would you summarise the achievements of Bomber Command? Well, I take my uh, satisfaction, not from my own opinion of what was done, but from the opinion of the people who know what was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you take the opinion of Field Marshal Milch, who commanded the air defences of Germany, mm -hmm. Albert Speer, who was solely and totally responsible for the production of everything in Germany, now you take their opinions. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it shows that the bombers, when I talk about the bombers, I give the Americans mm -hmm. full credit for their 50% share those people have made it quite clear that the bombers kept well over a million fit Germans out of the German army because of the bombing. Manning the anti-aircraft defences, making the ammunition, and doing urgent repairs, especially mm -hmm. tradesmen, mm -hmm. electricians, plumbers and people, yes. keep trying to keep the essential services to the factories if not to the, to the cities going after the bombing. Mm -hmm. The bombers kept at least a million, I say near a million and a half men out. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing that uh, Speer says, which is an eye-opener, but which we always suspected, he said that the bombing reduced the German anti-tank capability by 50 percent. Really? Now, no army on either side ever advanced a yard without the armoured force busting a way through. Yes. Yes. So if you reduce the anti-tank, anti-armour uh, ab ability mm -hmm. of an army by 50 percent, you have scored a major victory. Yes. Now they add those two things together, yes. well over a million men yes. kept out of the German army. Well over certainly 50% of their anti-tank capability destroyed by the bombing. Mm -hmm. I say that was the major victory on land of the whole war. Yes. No yes. army on any side achieved anything like that. And I this is what Speer has to say. It's in his book. Mm -hmm. He said the effect of the strategic bombing is always underestimated. Mm -hmm. It was, in fact, the biggest lost battle of the whole war for Germany, greater than all their losses in all their retreats from Russia and the surrender of their armies at Stalingrad. Well, he ought to know. Yes, indeed. Yes, if indeed. anybody. Well, thank you very much indeed, sir. I think, if I may suggest, that that's an appropriate time for us to take a pause and Good. some refreshment. That's good. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. Thank you. May we now turn, sir, from the strategy of the bomber offensive to concentrate rather more on the position and perhaps the personality of the Commander-in-Chief. Now, by 1942, you had already held several very senior RAF positions. We've already heard that by that time, when you came to High Wycombe, you had a very clear idea of what you wanted to do as a Commander-in-Chief. I wonder if you could tell us now, where did those ideas come from? What were the formative influences on you before 1942? Um, were they, for example, from your period as Deputy Director of Plans, or from your tour as AOC 5 group, or from your contacts with people like Lord Trenchard, or simply from your own accumulated experience? Would you care to comment? I think it was a matter of uh, accumulated uh, <coughs> experience. Uh, one grew up with this uh, <coughs> idea of the uses of uh, an Air Force. Uh, I never read any of those books you referred to, Do It and people mm -hmm. like that. In fact, I never heard of them until uh, after the war. Uh, maybe I should have. 
I knew all about Billy Mitchell and his yes. troubles yes. in the American yes. Air Force. Yes. But uh, also, I was lucky enough to have command of uh, squadrons with big aircraft yes. in uh, Mespot mm -hmm. and uh, in this country, uh, and also flying boats. Mm -hmm. So, uh, having spent much of my early days with camels and fighters and things like that, mm -hmm. And nearly all of it in night flying, both mm -hmm. in service and uh, on training, mm -hmm. I naturally gravitated towards the night bomber. My last uh, squadron command before the war was uh, at Worthy Down with uh, 58 Squadron of Virginias. Well, we knew even then that uh, they hadn't got a hope of surviving in daylight. So, of course, uh, one's ideas were f fixed and concentrated on uh, night bombing yes. and the difficulties of achieving it. I converted my squadron of troop carriers in Mespot in early 20s from uh, troop carriers into heavy bombers and night bombers. They were meant to carry eight fully equipped troops but I couldn't for the life of me see any occasion on which you would require to only eight fully equipped troops, or what the great idea was. So I cut a hole in the nose of the machines and uh, rigged up some bombing gear, and we promptly won all the bombing competitions, and we carried a really good load of bombs. I got them on tonight flying then, just so as we could uh, operate throughout the 24 hours. Wasn't there um, a, a slight degree of accidents, though, is my memory playing tricks, in the way you came to move onto the heavy aircraft in the first place? Did you not move from India under rather unusual circumstances? Leave India? Yes. Yes, I had a command of a squadron on the northwest frontier, 31 squadron. And uh, we were on the army vote there. Uh, the result was we got nothing. I remember my particular machine uh, showing with pride uh, to John Salmon when he came out to inquire into our deficiencies, showing him with pride uh, a large piece of the end of a paraffin uh, uh, packing case. You know, the case that takes two four-gallon cans which formed uh, the most important strut in the fuselage of my airplane. We couldn't even get proper ash wood to do the repairs with. And I spoke my mind on that pretty loudly on one or two occasions, and once to a general who made a rather mocking remark to me when he said we, he didn't need us to operate for the next three or four days, we were right up in the frontier landing ground. I said, well, in that case, I'd better get back to Peshawar. Oh, he said, oh, you people in the Air Force, you can never operate without uh, getting back to your bases, get all your spare parts and things. I said, yes, we must get back to our ball of string, which is about all we've got. <laughs> So I think they asked for my removal, but John Salmon was out there and agreed with the frightful condition we were in. And he said, you're leaving India, but I'll give you a squadron in Mespot, where he was about to go and take over from the army. Yes. That's how I got into yes. heavy aircraft. But I was uh, engaged on night flying, really, before that, in fighters and in uh, what went for bombers in those days, like yes. the old FEs. Because yes. you actually pushes. you actually flew as a fighter pilot in World War One, did you not? Yes. In the in the air defence of Great Britain. Yes. yes. Uh, I had a flight. Uh, I had the flight which contained Leif Robinson that brought down the first zip. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just been. I was away on four days leave at the time to get married. 
and I was just being transferred to start another defense squadron in the Midlands, anti-Zeppelin. But you could hardly call them fighters in those days. They were the old B-2C with one wobbly handheld Lewis gun. However, they did the job. Yes. Yes. Well, much later then, sir, you, you assumed the position of Deputy Director of Plans at the Ministry of Defence, where you were in a position to see very clearly for yourself the state of the nation's defences and the preparations that were being made. Are there any particular memories which stay with you from that time? Yes. Uh, I was on the Joint Planning Committee of the Three Services, of course, when I held that job. And though I says to shouldn't, I think if you took the final paper we produced on the probabilities of the next war, it was almost prophetic. My opposite number, Ted Morris, Colonel Morris, who was an RE, and Admiral Tom Phillips, who was a great friend of mine, the naval commander, he went down Singapore. in the Prince of Wales. But we shared the same digs. I could never convince him or any NO, any more than Mitchell could, that the battleship had it coming to them from the bomber. The yes. results were sad. Yes. 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 The captain of uh, Prince of Wales who went down was also a friend of mine. He was the naval. Uh, student in my term at the Army Staff College when I was this sole Air Force representative there as a student. Yes, yes. So then, if we could come forward again, sir, to 1942, it would be fair to say then that the influences and the, the opinions, rather, which you had formed were largely as a result of your own experiences and the planning and the work that you'd done there's just one other point. Um, you are very widely quoted, I think, in a very well-known cameo of standing with Lord Portal, looking out over the Blitz, watching the impact of the German raids. And you made you uttered a rather prophetic comment there, I think, didn't you? Yes, I remember the night well. You could see St. Paul standing out amidst the flames. We wondered if St. Paul was going up with the rest of it. And uh, I told Portal, who was still working uh, down in his office, I said, you better come up and see this because it's uh, something that will probably never occur again, or we hope won't occur again. It's worth seeing. And he came up and we discussed it. And I said, we knew, of course, what we were expecting in the way of bombers from America. Before America came in, we were going to get all the thousands they were going to produce for our own use. Mm. And I said then, well, they're sowing the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. And they certainly did. Yes. Did, did you find it possible or difficult to isolate personal feelings from professional considerations later on? This obviously made a very great impact on you. Mm. seeing your own country being engulfed, your own capital city being engulfed like that. Did that have any subsequent influence on the way you conducted the campaign at all? No, not at all. No, uh, I conducted the campaign strictly in accordance with the directives yes. that were issued to me, subject only to the overriding requirements and demands of Eisenhower and, of course, uh, Monty, because I was told to give him every possible assistance. And we certainly did. Monty's, uh, well, the files of Bomber Command are full of thank yous, or should be, unless somebody's removed them <laughs> from Monty no, and so. Eisenhower. So. And so is my personal study. Yes. So then, coming back then, sir, to High Wycombe, um, 
one of the comments I've heard you make before is on the enormous quality of the men who worked for you. And I wondered if I, I could just seek your views on one or two aspects of your relationships with your subordinate commanders. How, for example, did you retain contact with your group commanders and lower down with your squadron commanders? Well, uh, I was running a battle, even if it didn't come off. I had to arrange a major battle every day and watch it develop every night. And people said I didn't get around amongst the squadrons. But they've never explained to me how one can put on a major battle every 24 hours and watch it happen and still spend your time wandering around the squadrons. I had to leave that to the group commanders. My personal contact with the group commanders was generally by getting them to come up and see me, which uh, most of them did whenever they wanted anything. I don't see how I could possibly have kept any closer contact with the actual crews. Uh, I did manage to get there once or twice, especially after Saunby was given to me as uh, my deputy, because I could absolutely rely on him to do either what I said should be done or what he knew I uh, would want done. I always regarded him as, uh, at that time, the best brain in the Air Force. He would have gone a long way, but he just didn't want to. He said he'd worked up in Bomber Command as SCSO, and he was just beginning to see the fruits of his labors, and he didn't want to be transferred anywhere else. He deliberately forewent, if that's the word, yes. promotion. Yes. Yes, he was in sick. order to stay yes. uh, with the command. Yes, he, he, he remained a very, very loyal number two, did he not? Oh, the entire, yes. The Wonderful fellow. Years. Wonderful fellow. What sort of qualities then, sir, did you look for in your subordinates? Qualities? Yes. Well, first I wanted people with a practical background who knew how to fly and knew what they were talking about where flying was concerned. Uh, just by luck, uh, Saulnby was one of my flight commanders in Mespot in 19, the early 1920s. Uh, Rafe Cochran was the other flight commander. I was very lucky to have them both because they knew my ideas and I knew theirs, and they're both outstandingly brilliant people. Did you in fact have any influence on the selection or promotion of those officers? Because that was a coincidence, wasn't it, that your two flight commanders at that time should again be two such important people in your organization? Well, that was not of my doing really, because Saunby was there when I took over Bomber Command. Yes, of course he was. Yes, of course he was. And uh, Cochrane was sent to an OTU the OTU headquarters, and uh, he wasn't frightfully happy there. He wanted to be on the active side. And when they came to some discussion as where to put him, I naturally said, I want him, and I want him very badly. He's brilliant, and he knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. He's technically very able, as well as being a first-class staff officer. And he was a very good pilot himself. So I couldn't have been happier with those two. The other commanders I had, uh, Rice, I'd known all my service life. It's a thoroughly sound. Harrison, the same. Addison was new to me, but he did remarkably well with his hundred group, spoofing the Germans, uh, running, this, running the Maquis and spy dropping game, and also running the night uh, fighters when we began to get a few intruders. They all did very well. I couldn't have 
had a better bunch no. of fellows. Was there any particular quality among those men, to, for example, among the men working with you every day? Um, you must have, under those kinds of pressure, you must have had to form assessments and judgments of men quite quickly to decide how much you could trust their word, their judgment, and so on. Was this a difficult thing to do under pressure, or did you find by this time I you were doing it easily? I don't think so, you know. When you're living and working with people all day and every day, you mm. very soon size them up yes. from the point of view of whether you think they're doing their job properly and whether you think you want them or yes. don't want them. Yes, yes. Because I'm sure, as you know, one of your, your very great admirers is now Marshal of the Royal Air Force, uh, Lord Elworthy. Mm. And he describes how you actually fired him on one occasion. I don't, I don't know if you recall that. How what? But you actually sacked him on one occasion. Yes, I can't remember that occasion, but I do occasionally have a joke with him about it. Yes. Uh, only the other day I was oh, talking to him. But, uh, he lives in Windsor Castle yeah. now. And <laughs> I was pulling his leg, but I can't remember offhand the circumstances. I don't think it was really, uh, you know, fired him, but uh, I think it was moving him from A to B or something. From, from what I heard, sir, um, or I've seen a comment that he, he made about it, I gather that um, you were both men of very strong opinions and that he was the group captain and you were the C&C. &C. And that this might have had something to do with the, with the problems that arose until he, he learned to adjust to the... Uh, <laughs> I don't really remember having <laughs> any problems with him. I've always well, liked him so much. He's a first-class fellow. Yes, yes. Well, sir, although you could obviously influence the appointment of subordinates, there wasn't a great deal you could do about the people you were actually reporting to and working for. And you are on record as having a very, very great respect for Sir Winston. Um, was that always the case? Did you find that you worked very easily with Sir Winston from the first days? Or Yes, I found he was always very helpful. Uh, insofar as he had it in his power to help. But of course he had everybody else uh, pecking at him. Yes. The Navy and the Army all wanting this, that and the other thing. And he'd help me one day and then uh, I'd find maybe a week later that the help he'd given me had somehow been cut in half by the help he had been forced to give to others and so on. I remember him at the end of the first year, we were supposed to be expanding, expanding, expanding. And he said to me uh, at dinner at Chequers, well, how's the expansion going? And I said, it's going fine, Prime Minister. Actually, I have 13 squadrons fewer today than I had when I took command a year ago. He was absolutely shattered, but it was a fact. Uh, there was one saving point about that situation. Of course, the Lancasters were coming in, and actually I disposed of the same or even slightly greater weight of attack, even with the fewer squadrons. Mm -hmm. Did he show any awareness of the kind of problems you were experiencing from the German Air Force? We mentioned earlier today, sir, the tremendous problems of navigation, of finding, locating, and hitting the targets. But not the least of your problems was the considerable growth, both in size and in quality, I think, of the German night fighting force as the war went on. Yes. Was Churchill aware of that kind of problem? And oh, time? I think so. I think he realized that that was what was happening. But as I told him on more than one occasion, Old Boom, old Boom Trenchard, always used to say, drive a fellow on the defensive, and you got him beat halfway. And uh, we were rapidly driving the German onto the defensive. So much so that uh, by the end of 43, I think I'm right in saying, the amount of German Air Force supporting their armies in Russia had been reduced from 50% of their air force to under 20%. And finally, 
as you know, we had absolute, uh, not superiority, but supremacy during our invasion of France. And that was due simply to the fact that the Germans in the last two years of the war had concentrated virtually everything in the way of production, training, everything on trying and failing to protect their own country. Yes, I, I'm intrigued to hear that, sir, because I, one can't help comparing the conditions which you inherited in 1942 in Bomber Command with those, for example, which General Auchinleck accepted when he took over the Eighth Army. Sure. And I wondered if, for example, in the summer of 1942, when you recall Sir Winston was under very strong political pressure in the House, at that time was he pressurizing you in the same way that he was pressurizing General Auchinleck, for example? No, I wouldn't say he ever pressurized me. He was always very enthusiastic uh, if I told him anything that pleased him in what we proposed to do. Uh, he always adopted the attitude, well, the sooner the better, let's get on with it. But he was very careful, he never gave me an order. He was very careful to avoid that. With one exception, he used repeatedly to say, don't fight the weather as well as the enemy. Well, not all very well in this climate, but look at it. Right. If you don't fight the weather, you don't fight, and that's the end of it. Right. Did you ever have any dealings with any other members of the cabinet, apart from Sir Winston? Oh, yes. Uh, Stafford Cripps. We well, Minister of Aircraft yes. Production. Yes. Ernie Bevan, a yeah, marvellous old boy, old yes. Ernie Bevan. Yes. Well, I always found him very encouraging and very helpful if he could help. The uh, Herbert Morrison, little Red Ellen Wilkinson, they all used to come down and visit us at Bomber Command and look at the results. The, the reason I was asking that, sir, is that although I know you have never said or written this, to the best of my knowledge anyway, there appears to have been some way a change in relationships between Bomber Command and the government near the end of the war, which appears to have culminated in the failure of the government to recognize, by a campaign medal, all the work that Bomber Command did. And I wonder, wh why do you think that was? I don't think there was any change in the relationship at all. Uh, but I don't think that it ever entered Winston's head that uh, Bomber Command should have had a campaign medal. And of course, I only heard they weren't going to get one after the Eighth Army had got theirs. Rather late in the day, I heard it. So I naturally took it up, and I don't think he wanted to alter arrangements that he'd already made. Mm. But when you uh, read now of what the Germans say our share of the war was, quite apart from people like Monty and Eisenhower and co, one realizes that uh, if the Eighth Army got a campaign medal for every cook, butcher, and candlestick maker in the back areas, the bomber crew certainly deserved a special one. Yes, yes. I know there has been speculation um, about whether the reaction in some less well-informed areas about raids such as Dresden, for example, allied perhaps to the... No, this was decided long before the controversial Dresden business cropped up. That I'd like to touch on to this extent. You know, you never hear any condemnation of the total destruction of saint Lazare and Lorient, two French towns on the Atlantic coast belonging to our defeated allies who were squirming under the jackboot of the common enemy, invader, no comment about that. Why? 
because apparently it was ordered by the Navy, so it's quite all right. That was the funny attitude that exists. At the same time as I was told to destroy Saint-Nazaire and Lorient, I was also told to do the same to Bordeaux, the second largest city in France. The idea being that uh, they were operating the submarines from there. Well, as a matter of fact, the actual submarine base was a little distance out of Bordeaux, so all the destruction of Bordeaux would have achieved would have been to have embittered the French forever, killed thousands of French, and maybe deprived the submarine crews of some of their girlfriends when they were on leave. It wouldn't have had any effect on the submarine war. So I refused to do that without a written order signed by Winston as the Minister of Defense, which was not forthcoming because he was always, one thing he was always pushing into me, don't kill Frenchmen, don't kill Frenchmen. Well, I must say I didn't feel quite so worked up about uh, whether Frenchmen got it in the neck or not, because they should have fought a bit better for their own country and not left it to us to do it all. Right, right. Thank you, sir. Now, you mentioned earlier, sir, this morning, um, about your relationships with the United States Air Force generals. And I would imagine that sometimes when resources are scarce and personalities are strong, misunderstandings will arise. And indeed, personal relationships become very, very important. Um, would you care to comment on your relations with other Air Force commanders, such as Lord Dowding or Lord Portal, Lord Tedder? Portal, I always had 100% respect for. He was an absolutely first-class type in every way. He was far and away the best brain in any of the three services. I think he was the backbone of the Chiefs of Staff quite apart from his job as being boss of the Air Force. Uh, people say I had a dispute with him over oil. Well, I had uh, arguments with him over various things. But they weren't uh, bitter arguments, they were discussions. And naturally enough, I had the job of doing. He had the job of saying, see if you can do this. And I had to argue whether I thought I could or couldn't. Uh, as for that uh, Dresden business that is always cropping up, Dresden was bombed on a direct order from Eisenhower's headquarters. And when I informed the Air Ministry that I'd got the order to wreck Chemnitz, Leipzig, Dresden, in that order. I had it confirmed in writing from the Air Ministry. Well, about that time, all the big shots were up in Yalta, disputing with each other. And at the same time, Winston, I think, was having a somewhat bitter dispute with Archie Sinclair, the Secretary of State for Air, as to what, if anything, we were doing to help the Russians forward. And in between all this triangle emerged this order to write off Chemnitz, Leipzig, and Dresden in that order, which we did. There was one other reason for it. The intelligence side of uh, the services, and I think of the civil side, intelligence, <clears throat> we're all under the impression, I think they were misinformed, that the Germans were preparing an Alpine redoubt in the foothills of the Alps. Yes. And in this redoubt, the stories got wilder and wilder. They had underground factories, 
Uh, they were getting all their best troops moved in there, vast stores of ammunition, probably super new unheard of weapons which would out atom the atom bomb, etc., etc., etc. And when we defeated them otherwise, these picked troops were going to move back into that redoubt and carry on the war at immense cost in casualties and chaos and money to the Allies. Well, the whole thing was an absolute mare's nest. There was barely a word of truth in it. I think one or two caves were uh, used as factories, uh, but for general purposes. But there you are, Chemnitz, Leipzig, yes. and Dresden were the last through routes yes. by road and rail in which the German forces and reserves could be moved north to south or south to north, and especially back into that redoubt. Yes, I think there's, there's no doubt at all, sir, that in the last 20 or 30 years, the, the name of Dresden has assumed an emotional association out of all proportion to what was happening elsewhere. But as I say, do you ever get here any tears shed over L'Oreal no, and Nazar? How often do we hear, for example, of the comparison with what the Royal Navy did in the blockade in World War I? Exactly. To Germany. So it's... Yes, that blockade. Quite. Of course, the thing is that the Air Force is always accused of carrying out war against the civil population. All major wars are always and always have been against the civil population. Now, uh, as you say, in the first war, the naval blockade, what strategy did any navy ever have except war against the nation as a whole? Absolutely. By blockade. Absolutely. They had no other strategy. They couldn't have any other strategy. There's no such thing as another naval strategy. And in the first war, according to the figures we produced, uh, the blockade of Germany is uh, stated to have killed 800,000 Germans. Yes. As for the army, what army besieging a major city has ever allowed the civil population out? I've heard no example, bar one. Haven't they always adopted the idea the more mouths in there, the sooner they'll have eaten the last cat, dog, and sewer rat and have to, have to come out and surrender? And meanwhile, every missile they can lob into the unfortunate city is lobbed in there. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And believe you me, as an ex rhodesian an ex-South African, I would find it very hard to convince my many Africana friends that armies don't fight against the civil population. Our last great colonial war was the Boer War. And the sole strategy in that war was scorched earth, burn the farms, 30,000 of them, destroy the crops, slaughter the cattle, shoot or loot the horses, make life insupportable throughout the breadth and length of the land so that the commandos in the field could find no succor or sustenance anywhere. And with what result? The non-combatants from those farms had to be concentrated in camps. That was when the word concentration camp originated. And with what result? Owing to the usual, what the Yankees called snafus, we call ball ups and uh, the lack of medical knowledge in those days. What happened in that war was that 14,000 men and boys down to the age of 12 died in the field of battle, Boers. 39,000 Boer women and children died in the concentration camp, directly due to the scorched earth policy. Yes. All major wars yes. have always been, and in the future will be ever more so, directed against the nation as a whole. Yes, I think it's, I think it's very important, sir, to keep that kind of point in context. 
I wonder now if we could just look at one or two other aspects of your relationships. Um, did you see a great deal, for example, of Field Marshal Montgomery? I've known uh, Montgomery for years before the war because he was a teacher at Camberley Staff College when I was a student there. Uh, and I was always very impressed by two things. One was the clearness with which he could expound his own ideas, which I always thought sounded to me first class, uh, and the rather uh, mocking attitude that the cavalry mind uh, held for him as being just one of these infantier fellows, you know, who really didn't know much about war as a whole. And then, of course, he came out to Palestine when I was AOC in Palestine a year before the war. And it struck me straight away the speed with which he picked up uh, the job, and especially cooperating. He started by, uh, as soon as he saw me, he said, this is no, no place for aircraft, no job for aircraft. I said, no, no job for soldiers either. It's a job for police, but there ain't none. And after that, he very soon was demanding air help and making very useful suggestions as to how it should be applied to help the army. We very soon concocted a system whereby we put a, what we called an air pin on a, an area, told drop pamphlets, used loudspeakers saying, don't move out of there or you'll be shot. If you stay where you are, you won't be hurt. And then the army went in there in buses and mopped up the grabbed off the fellows they wanted to grab, if they could find them, in the hidey holes, which was a great improvement on staggering all night over the mountains and then finding the bird had flown by the time they got to the place. Right. Your comments about um, Palestine before the war lead me to, to ask you, um, again, a slightly different aspect of that same period. Now, the Royal Air Force has been, at least as far as major wars are concerned, at peace for something like 30 years. And it's sometimes suggested that training for leadership in peacetime is different from the problem or dealing with the problem in wartime. I wonder, sir, if you could comment for us on the qualities required from a commander in wartime and whether you think they differed from those required or indeed shown by the perhaps the immediate pre-war group of RAF leaders? Yes, well I'd say that nowadays they've altered since the older days of my extreme youth because uh, a leader today and more and more every day has got firstly to be an expert from the technical point of view. Yes. He must understand what his equipment is, how it works, and what its limitations are. Otherwise, he won't get to first base, as our Yankee friends say. Once he's got an absolute grasp of the technical side of his job, then I think a uh, matter of leadership just becomes a matter of being able to get his staff to uh, work tidily and follow his ideas properly, and uh, quite frankly, to be more or less liked by those who work for him. I'm not a believer in the popularity jack who goes around slapping everybody on the back, because I don't think they like it. But uh, a leader has got to be liked by those he's asking to work. Yes. Yes. If they had to do their best. And today he's got to be more and more an expert technician, understanding what goes on in the works. Otherwise, he'll very easily drop spanners into it. Do you think that was part of the problem or contributed to some of the problems we had as a peacetime service before 1939? That perhaps some of our commanders were not quite as in touch with frontline developments as they might have been? Yes, well, you see, <clears throat> the, uh, 
the top Air Force people during the Great Peace, for a greater part of it, uh, were people who'd maybe done two or three figures of eight and got a ticket, as they called it, but had gone straight into command. And uh, quite a few of them really didn't understand technically what a lot of it was about. Uh, especially such things if you put up a request, say, I must have marker bombs. You say, oh, I must have this, that, or the other type of uh, electrical gadget. Terribly hard to get it over. Some people, I won't name any names, but I remember having really quite an unpleasant argument with a very senior officer who mocked at the other idea, at the very idea of having artificial horizons put into our night bombers. Mainly on the ground that they were Yankee stuff anyhow. Well, so they were originally, of course. Yes. And that was a great difficulty. I always remember one very senior officer who was uh, very crippled and he went to look at an auxiliary squadron once, and I don't think he'd been crippled, he'd seen the inside of an aeroplane since pre-1914. But this auxiliary squadron had very kindly rigged up a platform with two rails so as he could stagger up easy steps, look into the cockpit of a modern fighter, where there was an auxiliary pilot strapped up in all his gear, surrounded by this mass of switches, levers, instruments, and what have you. And the old boy was absolutely astonished, so astonished he nearly fell off the platform. He said to this boy, you find this very complicated? He said, no, sir. He said, but are you a regular or auxiliary? I'm auxiliary, sir. And he went, say, you only fly weekends and you can understand all this stuff? Yes, sir. What do you do in civil life? He said, well, as a matter of fact, sir, I play a Merlitz, Wurlitzer organ in a cinema. <laughs> <laughs> sir, there's just one other question I'd like to put to you before we leave. Mm. If you had the time over again, would you do anything differently? If I had the same time over again, I would do the same thing. But I would always hope not to have the same time yes. over again. Yes. I only joined up as a volunteer, like everybody else did, or most people, in 1914, when I was very happily employed uh, farming in Rhodesia. Mm. And maybe I'm lucky I'm not there now. Yes. Well, sir, I think that that is a most appropriate point on which to conclude our discussion. And I would like to thank you very much indeed for answering our questions so frankly and so lucidly, dealing as they have done with such a period of enormous importance, both for our country and for our Royal Air Force. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. I hope it's of some value to future generations. I'm sure it will be, sir. Even if it only helps them to keep out of these sort of r rats. I hope so, too. They never do anybody any good in the end. No, no. Except possibly the loser. Yes, yes.